He goes all the way back to Abraham and he said, I am Hebrew of the Hebrews. Well, he does that because um, he's making the point that um, he can trace his lineage. And at the time, the issue is he's making a case against those who say we're better apostles or we're more Jews or we're, more, we're better to do this than is Paul. He makes the point that there is nobody more qualified to do this than I am. I can go back to Abraham and he says I am Jew of the Jews. And then he goes down to one of the 12 tribes, which is Benjamin. And he says, I am a son of Benjamin. Well, Benjamin happens to be, when the tribes split, Benjamin is one of the tribes that goes with Judah for the most part. So Benjamin is not absorbed into the tribe of Judah, but it is part of what we'd call the, the Judah nation. So he goes from Hebrew to tribe to race, and that's how we ended up with him being able to trace his lineage. Is everybody following me? Now today, so in that period of time, if you said you, if the term Jew was used, it was done specifically to note those who had come out of exile back into the land and was given to pretty much all who were in that group. The majority of which would have been Judites, Benjamites, Ephraimites, all carried into captivity at the same time. John? How do they keep track of their lineage? How do they, do they, is it written or is it passed down verbally and then they have to memorize it? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I can't go back to my great grandfather. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can most of mine, but the, but the reality is, John, it, it was originally uh, oral. But if you go back, in, in fact, start in Genesis, you'll see the beginning of genealogies. And in fact, genealogies in the Bible is one of the genres, and it was critical to be able to trace who you were from. If you go back far enough, you'll find where Mo that Mo both Moses and uh, Aaron came from the, uh, Levi the Levitic line. They both come from Levi. So it was important for Jews to be able to trace their lineage. And that was true all the way up to the time of Paul. I suspect by the time you get to Paul that it was a written lineage that you could find. I'll tell you where you can find the best lineages of all that's going to tell you all about it. You're going to find it in the first chapter of Matthew and in the third chapter of Luke. And in those two, and they're the only ones that have a birth narrative of Christ, they give you the lineage. Um, Matthew, I think, one of the two goes back all the way to Adam, the other one doesn't. Now they skip some of the ones in between. Uh, goes all the way back to Adam, I think it's Matthew's, I can't recall. And then uh, Luke's will go back maybe to Abraham. But you get the lineage of Christ through all of those. So it was very important in ancient Israel to be able to trace the line. Today, if you, there used to be a family, some of you might remember the Cohens, uh, um, that went to church at First B. They are direct descendants of the Kohathites, who were, well, their name is, I can't say they were, but were Kohathites that were descendants of the Kohathite tribe. So it was very critical back in that period of time to be able to trace those. Um, Paul does it to be able to say, you won't find anybody with better credentials to talk about the Old Testament and subsequently the New Testament than I am. Does that help pedigree. with, pardon? Pedigree. Well, it does with pedigree, but it also helps to, today, as I said, they're used interchangeably. If you said a Hebrew, you said he's a Hebrew, you would automatically say that's a Jew. Well, he might be a Jew, but he never would have been a Hebrew, as an example. Um, so Hebrew, Jew, Israelite, pretty much all used interchangeably anymore. But when Paul did it, he did it specifically for that purpose. So I thought it was important to go back and kind of build the, the case for how all of this occurs, because we often mix those up, especially when we're reading in the Old Testament, we often mix those up, and they really weren't. It was the progression, and I, put, I think I put the progression down here below, from Semite to Hebrew to Israelite to Jew. Does that make sense? All right. Um, um, is there a particular reason the country named itself Israel instead of Jew or anything? Is there a particular meaning to see in Israel? Um, the only thing I can think, I don't know if there was a particular reason given to it, but the northern tribes uh, were generally the, the dominant tribe. If there was a, do, a dominant tribe in the south, it would have been Judah. If there was a dominant tribe in the north, it would have been Ephraim. Ephraim would have been one of the sons of Jacob, and as a result, you remember where when 
uh, Jacob adopts um, Joseph's two sons. One of them is Ephraim. So I would guess it has to do with that. I don't know that there was a specific reason that that was chosen, other, probably other than to be able to differentiate it from Judah, from the tribe of Judah. Because remember, the northern tribes become a collective, right? They become a collective of 10 tribes. By the time we get to the division of the nations, Simeon, if you ever look at a map of the lands that each of the tribes were given, <laughs> Simeon is in the heart of Judah. So by the time we get to that point, Simeon has almost been, uh, become part of the tribe of Judah. So it's rarely counted. So you typically get the 10 northern tribes and then Judah. We tend to think it was only Judah. There were the, some from the tribe of Benjamin, a majority of the tribe of Benjamin, which Paul notes, and some from Ephraim, and some from even some of the northern tribes that came down and settled in Judah when that division took place. That help? All right, now, let's get back to, uh, for any questions about Hebrews, Jews, Israelites? Again, today, they're used interchangeably but now you know a little bit about how they came about. Um, now, let's go back then to setting the stage. And I wanna hit, oh, three or four items here. The first is, when does all this occur? I'm one of those guys who likes to know when things happen. So, when does all this occur? What's, what's the timeline of Paul's life? Now, first of all, um, we don't really have any biblical evidence for uh, Paul's birth. Uh, in the Bible, what we do have is at the stoning of Stephen, he's called a young man. So most would probably put him at that period of time somewhere between the ages of 20 and 30, which means he's probably contemporary. He's probably born around the same time as Christ was. So um, in, that, in this timeline, I want you to notice a couple of things, and then we'll move on to uh, kind of the, the map of things. Notice on the the top, um, and this is going to become important in all of Paul's letters, but notice on the top the progression of uh, Roman Caesars from Tiberius to Gaius to Claudius. The, bit, the one we're most concerned about here is Nero. There are going to be two major persecutions in the first century of Christians, not just Christians but also Jews. One under Nero and one under Diocletian, who's going to be about the time of, John, of uh, John the Gospel writer, or when John writes Revelation. So I want you to notice that first. The second thing I want you to notice is this only lists three missionary journeys. We're going to get to a map here that's going to show four. I'm going to make a case that there may have been five. There's only three that are called missionary journeys because those are the three that are listed in the Bible. I'm going to make the case that there is a fourth, at least a fourth journey. If it wasn't a missionary journey, it was certainly a fourth journey. That's the one to Rome. And you'll notice a, a gap. You see the big gap here between uh, the first Roman prison imprisonment and ultimately the uh, execution of Paul and Peter? There's a big gap there. Well, that gap is about five years you could probably say three years at least because somewhere around 65, according to most biblical historians, is when Paul ends up going back into prison. When Paul goes back into prison, the first prison is what's house arrest, so it's not that big a deal. He's able to move him out. The second prison in the Mamertine prison is a, a deep, dark hole prison, and that's probably, they call it 65 or so. What happens in that gap? Well, Nobody's sh sure, but I will tell you this much, and we'll see it a little bit later as well. Paul says in Romans, when he writes, the book, uh, writes to the Romans, he says, I desire to go to Spain. And by that time, Spain would have been considered pretty much the end of the world. And you recall that Jesus says, you will carry my gospel first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and then in the rest of the world. Paul eventually wants to be in Spain. We don't have any biblical evidence that says he got there. What we do have is writings from Clement of Rome, who was a contemporary with Paul. In fact, he's referred to, I think, in Philippians. He said, my co-worker, who says he went to Spain. Whether that occurred or not, I don't have any more evidence than that. If it did, that's probably accounts for what you see here as the gap. So that's kind of the timeline of Paul. Um, but what about these journeys? And you've all probably seen maps of the, you've probably all seen these kind of maps. 
I want to just hit a couple high points here. These will be in, your, in the handouts as well. Um, thanks for the colors, because that really helps with each of the journeys. And you'll see four of them listed there. Three of them are listed as missionary journeys, and then the fourth kind of purple one just says the journey to Rome. If there was a journey to Spain, it likely started in Rome. Um, all of the rest, you'll notice, start uh, in, a, a, in, a, in Antioch, uh, with the exception of um, the journey to Rome, which starts in Sidon, or Caesarea. Well, the reason for that is um, Antioch, by this time, by, by Paul's time, and by Jesus' time, the three most important cities in the entire Roman Empire were first Rome, then, number two is Alexandria, which is in Egypt, on the northern coast of Egypt. And then Antioch. Antioch would have been the third most important city. By Paul's time, it has become literally the capital of the church. So Antioch is a, an important place and will continue to be an important place. Um, now you're probably saying, well, okay, how come there's two Antiochs? Actually, there were 16 Antiochs. Um, Seleucius, who was one of um, uh, Alexander the Great's generals, who eventually takes over part of this area, he had a um, progenitor named Antiochus. And as a result, he named 16 different cities. I don't know if any of them, ex well, this one does. Any of them still exist today, but this would, would have been called Syrian Antioch, opposed to, you see another one up there called Pisidian Antioch, we're focused on Syrian Antioch, which is just up the coast from uh, Jerusalem. Notice also there's a rapid progression of all of these. The first, three, uh, the first three trips are all compacted into a nine year period. Now we know that Paul spends two years, maybe three, in Ephesus. So that means that there's a bunch of time compacted into those missionary journeys. Um, and in those missionary journeys in Rome, probably from 62 to call it 66, is when we're going to get our prison letters. And our prison letters are the ones, all of them. Now, Galatians is not a prison letter. The other three are what are called prison letters. You'll see that here in just a second. Um, now, who, well, that's a good point. Who got these letters? Here's the, the church's that we're gonna see that got letters. Now, obviously some of them got more than one letter, but these are the churches that they would have gone to. Let me just hit two interesting pieces about this. First of all, um, they're all clustered, three pieces, they're all clustered around the Aegean and the Mediterranean. With the exception of Colossae, I think, they are all major seaport cities. They are also all on major thoroughfares, major Roman roads. Why would that be? If you want the gospel to spread, where do you want to be? Rome. Well, Rome, but first of all, you want to be someplace where you got people coming into port, you got people uh, carrying caravans back and forth. In fact, most people would say that's how, the, how um, Thomas spread the gospel to India was by following one of these important trade routes. So it's important to note the cities he goes to because all of them are critical in the Roman Empire and all of them critical trade centers. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense if you're trying to spread the word. I wanted to point out one other thing about this. Um, I, I haven't been able to prove, I haven't been able to find anything contradictory to this. Romans, the book of Romans, is a most interesting book because it's the only letter that Paul writes to a congregation without ever having been there. Paul doesn't end up in Rome until after writing the book, the letter to the Romans. In fact, he's going to say to him, boy, I sure want to come and see you guys, and I've tried to, but I've been delayed for this reason and that reason and this reason. And that's also where he's going to say, well, eventually I want to come and see you, and then I want to go on to Spain. Romans is the only book written to a church that Paul, first of all, Paul did not start. Secondly, Paul had never been to before he writes the letter. Um, well, what about Colossae? You know, we don't see a whole lot about Colossae in any of the trips. 
we do kind of a mention of it, but you'll notice it's only about uh, 100, it's actually 120 miles from Ephesus. When Paul spends his three years in Ephesus, the theory is that he spent a lot of time in just in surrounding churches. If you go look at the seven churches of Revelation, you're gonna see them all clustered in kind of the same area. <clears throat> the last thing I wanna note, Galatia. We don't have a little red dot for Galatia. That's because Galatia is not a city, it's an area. It's, it's like saying Southwest Colorado. Um, now, let's do one more, well, two Tom, more. Did you say that Antioch still exists today in the Syrian? Um, to the Syrian, I, you know, Ernie, I can't swear the Syrian one does. That's a good homework assignment, don't you think, Ernie? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff learned a long time ago, Ernie, don't ever ask questions. Or if you do, wait until the class is over. Um, now, let's look at kind of a timeline of Paul's letters. Um, You'll notice again, most put the crucifixion at 30. Um, there, is, there are two pieces on here I want you to notice. Uh, fully half of the books, half of the letters that Paul's gonna write are written from prison, either under house arrest or in, Roman prison, or in a Roman prison. The others, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Romans are not written when he's free to move about. All the rest, and maybe that's the reason he did it, didn't have a whole lot else to do, so I guess I'll write these letters. Uh, all the rest of them are, are uh, what are called the prison letters. You'll notice that the books we're going to look at, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians are all prison letters. The only one that's not is Galatians. wanted to point out one other thing. And we've had some discussion about this as well. In fact, we may have had the discussion last week. Um, Hebrews. You'll notice that Hebrews is on this list. Um, from about 400 to about 1500 A.D., the title of the book was A Letter of Paul to the Hebrews. After the Reformation and more biblical study, um, most, most would say today there are so many differences between, and I'll give you one of the differences right now, there are so many differences between all of Paul's writings and Hebrews that it cannot possibly be Paul. What we don't know is who it is. You could still probably say, make a case that it was Paul. Most would tell you it's probably Apollos, maybe Barnabas, no one really knows. It's only one of four books Four, let me rephrase that, one of four letters in the Bible that does not have from somebody to the church of. The others are, are John's epistles. None of John's epistles say from John to such and such. Hebrews and John's corpus, John's letters are the only ones that don't identify who the writer is. Very common. In fact, all the rest of them say, they'll say something like Paul and, and maybe Paul and Timothy and Silas to the church at such and such. Hebrews does not. The other indicator we have that Hebrews is probably written by somebody else is in Hebrews, and I don't remember the exact verse, but in Hebrews you find this. Um, the spread of the gospel first from the Lord Jesus Christ, then to, those who, then to those who heard him, and then to us. Well, by writing that, then to us, it's, take, it's taken them out of being first, uh, first hearers of the gospel. That means it can't possibly be Paul because Paul definitely heard from Jesus. So today, most people would say Hebrews is probably written by someone other than Paul. It's included here on the list, and I don't know if it's just that it's separated just so you see what the book is, but most people today would not say Paul's written by Hebrews. I mean, Hebrews was written by Paul. Um, let's see, I wanted to look at two more slides. Oh, years. Okay. The, yeah, that's the timeline. Okay. So 30s, the crucifixion. Um, 50, around 50. The Jerusalem Council is a huge issue. If you've never read um, Acts 15, let me tell you what the Jerusalem Council is all about. In the early church, um, who are the first apostles? Jews. They were all Jews, right? They thought, and they, until we get to Peter and, and Cornelius, they thought that the church was there for the Jews. Well, 
in uh, the Jerusalem Council, Paul goes back, and this is after his first missionary journey. He goes back to Jerusalem. He says, listen, you guys are wrong about this. This is not just a gospel for the Jews. It's a gospel for the Gentiles. And he makes the case that he's carried the message to the Gentiles, and there's Gentile believers all over. So the Jerusalem Council is probably the stamp of of approval from the early church saying, yes, it is a gospel to all believers now. That's kind of the, well, I would make the point that the, the Gentile church actually, actually begins with Philip and the Ethiopian. Um, but this would kind of be the, okay, we agree with you, it's now a, a gospel not just to Jews but to Gentiles. So then the final piece of the, of the uh, timeline is the destruction of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple in 70. Um, Paul's going to be dead by then, probably 67 or 68. I, I, I'm not sure why they have the book of Acts and then Revelation, unless whoever put this chart together was a believer in, in uh, the historic view of Revelation being written about the same time as these occurring. If not, then they're using Revelation to say the revelation of Paul to all of these, to First and Second Timothy, Titus, etc. John? Just to digress a little bit, Paul being a Roman citizen, why, why was he being thrown in jail? Twice. <laughs> <coughs> we'll get to a major reason for it here in just a minute. <coughs> um, first of all, the first time he was thrown in jail, by the way, he's in, in jail on a number of occasions, not just in Rome, but he's all under house arrest. He's also in Caesarea. Let me see if we've got a chart on that, John, if I've got one. Does this one do it? No. Give me just a second. This might help us a little bit. So here's what happens, John. Um, he's in jail because Jews, the Sanhedrin, have brought charges against him of insurrection. So they go to the Roman authorities in Caesarea. First in Caesarea, which is down on the coast, not far from Jerusalem. They go to the Roman authorities, and at the time, the Roman uh, capital of the province is in Caesarea. They go to Felix, the first governor, and they say, this guy is preaching insurrection. And Felix puts him in jail at that point, saying, I ah, will deal with it some other time. Two years later, Felix still hasn't dealt with it, and Festus takes over for him. So he's in jail because the Jews, his own people, have accused him of insurrection against Rome. There were only two things, only two things exacted capital punishment. Well, I can't say only two. The two most important things that exacted capital punishment in Rome during the time was, first of all, insurrection. Secondly, <laughs> Failure to pay your taxes. Either one of those could result in death. That's why Paul is first in Caesarea in the, in being languishing in the jail. Finally, Festus comes, and in chapter 22, 22 or 23 of Acts, Festus takes over the governorship from Felix. And Festus says, well, we need to have this trial. So he calls the Sanhedrin down. Sanhedrin makes their case. Paul goes and he makes his case before Festus. Not only Festus, but before um, Herod Agrippa, who is now kind of the representative of the modern, Jew, uh, of the Jewish church at the time. And Paul says, and Paul gives them, he says, here's the story. And he does the same thing. I was Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was raised at the knee of Gamaliel. I, was, I persecuted the church. And then the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me and he said, this is my kingdom, but this kingdom has nothing to do with Rome. There is no insurrection. They get to the end of the trial, and Paul isn't sure how things are going. So as being a Roman citizen, Paul says, okay, look, I'm not going to deal with this kangaroo court anymore. I appeal to Caesar. The minute he appeals to Caesar, it's taken out of Festus's hands. Festus and, and Agrippa, it's recorded in the Bible, go on to say, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we would have had to let him go because there is no proof here of insurrection. So Paul you know, kind of puts himself in the position of being in prison in Rome. So now what's the big issue about being in prison in Rome? And that is this. Um, this is probably the, this I think is the last, yep, the last of the charts we're going to look at <clears throat> uh, on setting the stage. And I want, you to, I want you to notice a couple things. Look first of all on the far left-hand side. 
Um, you're going to see Emperor Nero from 54 to 68. So, what's that, 14 years or something? Felix is the governor of Judea from 52 to 57. That's when Paul's going to languish in prison, primarily because the Sanhedrin have brought charges against him. And then finally, or not finally, in a couple of places down, you'll see Paul's journey to Rome and house arrest 57 to 62. Notice what happens at um, about the same time. If you go up above that, the fire in Rome, Nero blames, uh, blames and persecutes Christians beginning in 64. So now that Paul's in Rome, here's the problem. He's a Christian. So what's Nero going to do? Nero's going to say, you guys caused the fire. And you're one of the instigators, so you're going into prison. So that's why, as a Roman citizen, he was put in prison. He never gets a hearing, as far as we can tell. He wants to, but as far as we know, he never gets a hearing in front of Nero. Um, then we, before we get to the Mamertine prison, the last bullet point down at the very bottom here, Paul's released from house arrest in Rome in 62 or 63. If he's not re-imprisoned until 65 or 66, that's the period of time that if there was a trip to Spain, that's when it would have occurred. So does that answer the question of why was Paul in prison? More than that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're my, I have to, my dad had a, this is one of the, the times that my dad had a pearl of wisdom. I got in late one night from, I don't know what it was, when I was still in high school. And the next morning he says, what time did you get home last night? Well, well dad, you know, first of all we had a flat tire and then we were going to such and such and then we were going to such and such and then by the time we got to such and such, then we did such and such and then, and dad very calmly said, I asked what time you got home last night. I did not ask for the history of watchmaking. <laughs> so sorry, John. I tend to answer more than I probably should. <laughs> uh, where was James Martyr? Um, I don't know if we're told, but I, I suspect in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Good job. Thanks, Jeff. Anybody want to know where James was martyred? We got two homework assignments running now. Uh, James becomes the leader of the church at Jerusalem. <laughs> James becomes the leader of the church at Jerusalem and, as far as I know, stays there. So if I had to bet, I would have to bet on Jerusalem. Oh, well, we don't hear a whole lot about it. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else we need on the setup? I'm Lynn? Give the answer to all of you, but not to him. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, because usually what I do is go home and look it up anyhow, just to see if you're right. So, All right, does that kind of set the stage for everything? Or as John would point out, it more than sets the stage? Then why don't we turn to Ephesians? Um, the book of Ephesians, the first one we're going to look at, and I want to do a little bit with the introductory to Ephesians. Um, and... I want you to note, we'll get to it in a little more detail, but in your outline, I want you to note something here. Um, we only have a lot of outlines in the Bible or in biblical books. You get a whole lot more than just two Roman numerals. We only have two Roman numerals in this book, and that's because it's going to follow a pattern that Paul does in a lot of his books. And the first is this, Roman numeral one, number one chapters one through the basically the end of chapter three that all deals with the doctrines of the members in Christ's body that's typically when Paul is going to say look here's why you believe what you believe here's what it is etc in other words the doctrines of the Christian faith that happens in almost well in most of his letters at one point or another here the second thing that happens is this duties of members of Christ's body. What does that mean? Well, after he set the stage for here's what the doctrines are, now here's how you are to go about it. In today's church, um, if you have pastors that do this, that um, some of you might have pastors that do this, they'll go through this whole thing and then they'll say, so what's the application? Well, chapters four through six is the application of what Paul talks about in the doctrine. 
that's where you're going to see a lot of, when we cross the principalizing bridge, you're going to see a lot of what applied to the Ephesian church applies to us today. This is a pattern, by the way, <coughs> excuse me, that you'll see in a lot of Paul's letters. Um, in this particular letter, <coughs> Ephesians, is not necessarily written to address certain problems in the church. Um, many of the other letters do. If you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it's going to talk about the problems in the church. Colossians is going to talk about Gnosticism. Ephesians is not. Ephesians is one of those that basically says, here's the gospel, and here's what, how we should be acting. Remember, Paul's real familiar with this church. He spent three years in it. He has groomed Timothy to be his successor. Timothy will eventually become the bishop of the church of Ephesus. Now, um, the circumstances, first of all, of the book. Um, in Rome, Paul was in official custody, first out of uh, first in house arrest and then in the Mamertine prison. Um, in writing this book, his movements are not restricted. He's under, chow, uh, under house arrest. But while he is under house arrest, the rest of the gospel is growing exponentially throughout the world without Paul, by other apostles, by um, uh, people that Paul has brought along. So the rest of the church, so those other areas, it continues to grow. So the Romans could imprison Paul, but they couldn't stop the message uh, that sprung up in all the churches that he founded. Um, the members of the churches were still proclaiming the gospel not only by what they said, but by the way they lived their lives. That should be critical to us today as well. Now, Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians to just strengthen the congregation. He wanted them to understand the spiritual reality behind the numerous groups that gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. They were, and he's gonna make the case here, he'll make it throughout all of, almost all of his uh, writings that they are the body of Christ. Now. <clears throat> author and date. We've already talked a little bit about the date. There has been questions, by the way, over authorship. Despite the fact that Paul says at least two times in this letter, it is Paul, um, and the fact that Luke describes Paul being in prison, um, and the fact that it's similar to some of his other writings. Despite all of those, you will always get somebody in the church, most of this beginning around the 1800s, that are going to question him. And part of the question or the controversy was that while they believe that Paul's, what Paul says in Ephesians is consistent with what he says otherwise, they talk about the, and this would be called something called textual criticism, they talk about how the text is somewhat different. That would not be atypical if <clears throat> many of the letters of not just Paul, but Peter as well, uh, are, were written by something called, and I think we've talked about this before, an amanuensis. An amanuensis is just a fancy word for saying a recording secretary. If you read through the letters of Paul, uh, I'm trying to remember which ones, several of them say from Paul, or they'll say Paul, Timothy, Silas, to the church at such and such. So it's, it, it's conceivable, in fact probable, that the letter, while dictated by Paul, and the concept by Paul, was the letter. It was written by someone other than Paul. In other words, probably a Timothy, maybe a Titus. So it makes sense that there would be some differences in the languages that that individual would use. That's been the only real, real uh, uh, controversial issue or question about did Paul write the book. Virtually everyone else has said Paul was the writing of the book. Now, what about Ephesus? Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. <clears throat> Today it's part of Turkey. Um, located at the intersection of several major trade routes, as we've talked about before, it was a vital commercial center in the Roman Empire. And I think we looked at a couple of these uh, last week. Here is Ephesus. Um, you'll see Antioch, Syrian Antioch, where uh, all the missionary journeys come from, and you can see kind of the route that probably would have been taken to Ephesus. Ephesus, not as I pointed out, not only on the coast, it's on, a, on two, at least two, of the major Roman thoroughfares. At the time, um, most people believe the population was about 200,000. That was huge 
for any city in, in the Middle East during this period of time. There are others today who said, nah, it's probably more like 50,000, and they do that just based on kind of the area of the city and how many people you could put in it. Really didn't make much difference. The point is it was a, a large and important city. Um, and here is, this is exactly what it looked like. Mm, not really. This is an artist's conception of what it looked like. You won't know because it doesn't exist today. And I can't even tell you what exists. Eileen, maybe you can. I can't even tell you how much is still, the ruins you can still see. I know you can see uh, a lot of them. I know you can see the... Houses. Yeah? Uh, shops. That, that are ruins from the, original, uh, from the original Ephesus. So maybe this isn't too far off, but um, I know, and I've got a couple of slides here. You can see this is the... the uh, Temple of Artemis, which will ultimately be changed to the Temple of Diana, which was a goddess of fertility. I did this one primarily so you could see the, the detail, the intricacies of what happens there. And it's then... Seven it is. That's right. Yep. Um, and this is the great theater at Ephesus. It, is, it doesn't exist today other than the ruins. I think that... I don't remember the name of the closest town, but it's like four miles away. Does that sound right? Now, uh, the reason I'm asking is um, Eileen and Len did a trip a while back, and one of the members of our church just returned from something called uh, the Pauline Journey, and it traces virtually every place that Paul went. Is that what you guys did? Yeah, it was called the Steps of Paul. Ah, probably the same thing. Um, uh, the 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 town of Ephesus was destroyed by the Goths, probably 63 AD, and then there was an earthquake that finally just shook it to its very core at 614, and what you see is left from that earthquake today. Um, is that a photograph or is that a rendition? That is a photograph. That's a photograph. Yep. That's the actual Yep. Um, and you can... You know, I extensively, I traveled the world and collected all of these photographs. So this is in my personal collection. Surprisingly enough, it's also on the internet. I don't know how it got there. But. Um, the most important part about Ephesus, though, was this, that it figures prominently and dramatically in early church history. Because Paul used Ephesus as kind of the center for his missionary work in the region. As I pointed out, for a three-year period of time, he didn't spend a whole three-year period of time in Ephesus. He probably went to surrounding areas like Colossae and Heropolis and who knows where else, kind of a, a traveling pastor. He, he first visits Ephesus briefly in his second missionary journey. The reason briefly is because they had tried to run him out of town. But he comes back in his third missionary journey, uh, which we've already looked a little bit at. He comes back to Ephesus. I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but Ephesus, if you follow one of the blue lines, you can follow the blue lines or the green lines, under Asia Minor and Turkey, you'll find Ephesus. So Paul's actually there earlier and then comes back and spends, in the second visit, spends this three-year period. Um, spends this three-year period and, um, and not only and if you go start, if you go look in Acts, here's what's going to happen. It's going to set the pattern for all of the churches, with the exception of Philippi, all of the churches that Paul goes to. The first thing he does is goes into the synagogue. And you're probably thinking, well, that's a dumb thing to do. They're going to run you out of town on a rail. Well, no, because he is still considered a rabbi, and I'm not sure how many people knew by the time he gets to these churches what he's been doing in churches behind him. He, as a rabbi, if he went into a synagogue, he was then usually said, well, why don't you give us a message? Because if it was a visiting rabbi, they would say, come in and give us a message. Paul would go in and give him a message, wouldn't he? He'd say, all right, let me tell you about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now you're getting all the Jews going, yay, 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 yay. And then he continues and he said, well, let me tell you some more about the prophets. And then he says, oh, and by the way, the prophets said there would be a Messiah. The Messiah has come. He was here. You hung him on a tree. That's probably when things went south in the synagogue. And the next step would be Paul would leave the synagogue and in some cases go into a house or in some cases a, a local 
uh, establishment of some type in, in Ephesus. Most believe he went into the school of Tyrannius, where then he would take the message to um, the uh, Gentiles. So let me ask you this. Why didn't he go into the synagogue at Philippi? Homework assignment. <laughs> no synagogue? There, that's it. There's no synagogue. You know what that tells us? That tells us in Philippi that the church was predominantly Gentile. And the reason is that um, have any of you, you've, well, if you don't have grandkids, you probably haven't seen the Minions movie. Have you seen the, uh, if you haven't seen Minions, that's where the term comes from. I'm actually kidding here. Um, there is a term in Judaism called Minion, M-I-N-Y-O-N, and Minion was literally a grouping of ten devout Jewish men. In order to establish a synagogue, you had to have a minimum, minimum of a minion. You had to have 10 devout Jewish men to establish a synagogue. When Paul goes into Philippi, there is no synagogue. That means there are not 10 devout Jewish men in Philippi. So all the rest of the churches I can think of, he goes into first into the synagogue. Um, so. Um, Paul in Ephesus, first thing he does is go into the synagogue and then eventually he's going to end up at the school of Tyrannus. Um, and in Paul's ministry, Ephesus was marked by several um, spirit-empowered miracles. Um, as a result, the city became a center for evangel evangelical outreach to the rest of the province of Asia. In fact, one of them was one of the miracles that you'll, you can read about in Acts. Um, resulted in the craftsmen, pagan craftsmen at the time, who made a living on crafting like statues to Diana or Artemis or something else. He got in the way of their their tradesmanship by saying none of that's uh, accurate. Those are all foreign gods. As a result, he gets run out of town on a, on a rail by those who tradesmen who are trying to. Um, uh, trying to make sure their livelihood could continue. Um, in Acts 27, uh, Acts 20, 17 through 38, Paul warned the elders of the Ephesian church about savage wolves. This is just before he goes back to Jerusalem, who would not spare the congregation. That's important to note because four decades later, um, John's going to write Revelation. And in Revelation, Jesus himself is going to talk about the only church that we'll talk about here included in the seven churches of Revelation is Ephesus. And the first thing he does, Jesus does, is he commended the Ephesians for hearing Paul and not to tolerating false teachings. But then he says, you need to go back and recapture the love you first had. That, first had. that was the love that Paul was talking about when he was in the Ephesian church in this period of time. Um, now, uh, Ian, did you have a question? No. Um, now, there's a lot of evidence that the Epistle of Ephesians was originally a circular letter, and we talked about that before. A circular letter is one that was intended for all the churches to be read. In fact, in some of the early, earliest uh, Bibles, um, the, the term Ephesus is left out. In other words, it says a letter of Paul, and the circular letter would have meant it was intended for all the churches. Um, seems likely that, that it is for all the churches because we don't see anybody named um, in the Ephesian church. The other churches we see people named that were in the church. Um, and finally, um, the idea that Ephesians is circular letter is not uncommon. All the New Testament epistles were eventually circular in that they uh, were circulated among the churches. They're certainly circulated among the churches today. Um, let's see, Cecilia, do you have to go? Uh, I believe. I think we've just about got this covered. And then we can start Ephesians next week. So let me just finish this up. Look at your handout again, and I want to note the themes one more time. Um, the first three chapters are, are doctrinal or Christian doctrines of the Christian faith. The last uh, four chapters, four through six, describe how 
spiritual truth should be reflected in a Christian's behavior. Now, some uh, would also divide the second half of the letter into two sections. The first, uh, first the Christian's conduct, and then spiritual conflict with forces of evil. Such a division highlights the familiar passages describing the spiritual. Let me ask you this. If I just walked into a room and said, the church at Ephesus, what's the first thing most of you would say? Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. Probably most people would say full armor of God. That's the thing that tends to stick out. The last chapter, the full armor of God, that's kind of the thing that tends to stick out with most people. Well, um, the last half of the book is dedicated to, the last half of the last half, dedicated to uh, dealing with the forces of evil. And such a division like this uh, highlights the familiar passages described in the spiritual armor of the Christian, all of which we get in chapter six. Now, what about today's application? The whole letter emphasizes the truth that all believers are united in Christ because the church is the, is, is the one body of Christ. Paul's going to hit that in every one of his letters. In some cases, uh, in Romans um, and uh, Corinthians, Romans and Corinthians, he's going to describe the body of Christ. Um, but that's the single, if I had to pick a single most important theme that runs through all, all his letters is that all Christians, and, and he'll continue to make this distinction between Gentile and Jew, all Christians are now one in the body of Christ. Um, whether Jew or Gentile, his point is you had to work together to, for the unity of the church, to make the unity of the church a reality. In the rest of the letter, Paul gives a number of practical ways for church members to fight against the forces of evil. And it's, he's going to focus again on not just the body, but that each individual has his or her part uh, at, for the church to function properly. And finally, each person has to display Christ's love, patience, humility, and gentleness as he uses their gifts to build up their church. Well, he's writing all that to the Ephesians. He's saying, okay, Ephesians, here's how you need to be a church. Doesn't have anything to do with us today. Has everything to do with us today, doesn't it? Isn't that exactly the message that the church should have today? That's why you can see it, the epistle. Well, in fact, I'm going to make the, the, term, the, the point that the Bible is timeless in what it teaches. There are principles, and we learned a little bit about the principalizing bridge. There are principles that apply to every one of the audiences then that apply to us today. Next week, boy, it seems like a long introduction to get to chapter one, doesn't it? Chapter one's only going to take 38 seconds, so we'll be, actually there's a bunch in chapter one. <clears throat> but it's important, as I said earlier, that you, that we, as we read, understand the background and history behind each one of these in order for them to make sense. Sure. All right. Uh, questions, comments? So how John? How do the current Jews look at Paul now? Where does he, how does he fit into their history? Um, if he, do they in the, look at him as a rabbi? Do they look at him as a No, I would not think so. In the Jewish church, he's probably relatively ignored, would be my guess. Right. Um, I don't know. I'll have to ask my good friend Aaron about how the how Jews would view Paul today. They will view, they'll tell you that they thought Christ was a prophet and that he was a good man, but he wasn't the Messiah. Paul, I suspect, there's one other place I can look, and I'll do that, John, because you probably don't have your copy of uh, the works of Josephus with you, do you? Uh, Josephus may tell us. <laughs> Josephus may tell us something, but Josephus focuses on Jews specifically. I would suspect you won't find anything about Paul. Uh, in fact, Paul's not even in it. Well, Paul's not anywhere. You won't find Paul anywhere in the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. You don't find Paul until we get into the New Testament. I would guess he's virtually ignored. Any others? Then why don't we stop here today and we'll get Mrs. Goble to do a closing prayer for us. And then we will be back here. Some of us will be back here Friday night for the 
church Christmas party or the Masters Men Christmas party. And then otherwise, I'll see you Wednesday. Mrs. Goble?